<clears throat> All right, so since we have, well, four, four or five students down here at the coast, depending on how you look at it, at least four here in a room, um, I'll be making occasional appearances uh, down here. Um, okay, so um, one thing uh, that's important uh, when you guys sit down and do the homework and you're going to this page to uh, get the problems, um, make sure you uh, refresh this page. So like in this case, if you're here in Firefox, to um, like I am, to reload the frame, in case I've deleted any problems. I just deleted a problem from this set uh, that you have coming up. Um, I will not add problems. Um, so uh, just to make sure that literally everyone is uh, on the same page. Um, so what I'm going to be covering today is, uh, since I've finished covering Chapter 2, is the uh, first part of Chapter 7, which is on polynomial interpolation. So um, everything up to this point has been about uh, central concepts for numerical analysis in general, but the remainder of the semester, and on into the second semester, uh, we talk about uh, here specific types of problems to solve. Like how, how do we fit data with polynomials uh, this time? We'll be doing uh, approximating derivatives and integrals later, etc. So this is the first uh, chapter of that type. Um, and then I expect that we'll have time uh, before class is over to take any questions about um, uh, the homework on the floating point arithmetic. Um, and as a reminder, um, on the questions page, if I get questions that are that would not give away answers, um, that, uh, that I'll, I'll be uh, posting them here as, as, as I get them. Okay, so, so be sure to uh, check those in case it already answers whatever question that, that you have. Okay. Um, so... Is everyone here? Are you okay with? I don't know if you want to turn off any lights or anything, or it's good the way it is. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so the problem that we're going to be looking at in this chapter, okay, is that if we're given um, points in the plane. Uh, so just x, y pairs in the x, y plane. And I'm going to number them from uh, 0 to n. So we're going to have n plus 1 points in the plane altogether. Um, find v polynomial, as in it's unique, pn, which I'll refer to as pn of x, of degree n, such that... Uh, n that passes through these n plus one points, um, meaning if I plug in any of the x values into this polynomial, I will get the corresponding uh, y value. Um, so, so this polynomial p n of x is the interpolating polynomial of degree n for this data. Um, so, so this, so this chapter is all about, uh, given the points, how do we actually get the polynomial? And there are various methods uh, for doing that. Um, as we get toward the end of a chapter, the data may not, might not just be the points, maybe we'll have extra information, like not just the y values, but also uh, derivative values. So how do we take that into account as well? But for now, and into next, next week, we're just going to focus on uh, this problem right here. Um, now, um, a the simplest version of this problem is one that you all learned how to solve long ago. It, it would come up in, in an algebra class. So, so you already know or should know how to solve case of n equals 1. Find the equation of a line passes through, so n is 1, so we're going to have two given points. So really, what we're doing is, how do we generalize that 
to any number of points and therefore a polynomial of any degree. So if you're given three points, what is the unique parabola that uh, uh, passes through them? <clears throat> okay. Um, now, there, like I said, there are different methods for coming up with this polynomial. I'm only going to talk about one of them today, and that is uh, Lagrange interpolation. Um, but as a, as a setup for that, um, I'm going to show a way that appears to be the most straightforward, but is really not the best way to go. And I'm, and I'm going to do everything today in the setting of an example. Um, so you can um, see more concretely how these, um, how these methods work. So I'm going to um, work with some data here. Um, let's see. Whoops. All right, so I'm going to Describe this data in two columns. All right. So first, so x values on the left, y, y, y values on the right. So I'm going to give four points. So first, x is zero, y is minus one, and then we have uh, x will be one. Sorry, so we got so we got a whack here. Two and three. All right, so those are my x values, 0, 1, 2, 3. And then I'll fill in some y values. Oh, sorry. My table's a little messed up. Oh, my tabular command went away. Hello. OK. Sorry, sometimes when I start typing these things, you never know where they're going to end up. Okay. All right, so I will be my index from 0 to 3. So just as I number the points from 0 to n, um, I get a number of them from zero to three. Sorry, my LaTeX editor here is being horrendously uncooperative again. Okay. All right, so zero for three my indices. My uh, points will start off at minus one and then zero, one, and two. Okay, now the y values that go with them, I'll fill in the third column. So I'm going to have uh, three, minus four, minus 5, minus 6. OK. Oh, wait. 5 does not have a minus. OK. All right. So the idea is, since I have uh, four points all together, so n being 3, I want to find the cubic polynomial. So what is the cubic polynomial? that passes through these points. OK. So here's what I could do. If, if we want to have the most straightforward way to come up with this polynomial, um, I can assume, since my polynomial of degree 3 is P3 of x, has this form. So I have a coefficient a0. So I'll, I'll go from yeah, lowest power to highest. a0, constant term. a1x, a linear term. a2x squared, my quadratic term. a3x cubed, 
um, my cubic term. So typical way of writing a polynomial of whatever degree. So really, the unknowns are my coefficients. I have four unknowns. So I need to come up with equations that will specify these um, be, that, that will um, that I can solve to get these coefficients. So to get equations, I substitute in the x values. Okay. So I go ahead and do that. Um, and first I'll do with general notation, then um, filling specific specific numbers. So a0, a1, x0. So I'm going to plug in x0. And then x0 squared plus a3 x0 cubed. So if I substitute x0 into this polynomial, I have to get the y value as a result. So that'd be y0. So now I have one equation that helps me nail down these coefficients, but I have four points that I have to match. So I can go ahead and uh, duplicate this and fill in the other x values. So x0 and then x1, x2, x3. And then same over here, 1, 2, 3. And then on the right side, I'd have y0, y1, y2, y3. So now I have exactly what I need, four equations, four unknowns. And the nice thing is, even though there are not linear expressions in here, like uh, x values squared, x values cubed, those values are known. The unknowns, my coefficients, are only involved in these equations in a linear way. So what we have is... Um, have n linear equations in n unknowns, a0, a1, up to an. So you might think, oh, okay, let's just go ahead and solve the system of equations. And then we're done. We have our polynomial, and that's the end of a chapter. Um, and if this was a class where everything was worked out on paper, um, Maybe we go with that, but this is where computers doing the work. So no, that's not where we stop, because it's actually not the best method. It's not the most practical method. Um, so so we can solve this, but here's why we won't. Um, so there are two reasons in particular. Because remember, um, what are the three criteria that any numerical method has to possess? So there's three objectives that we have. Um, I'll, I'll mention one of them. The one that will be satisfied by this approach is um, this will, for the most part, in most cases, accurately give us the uh, coefficients. But... What else, whatever properties does the numerical method need to have? So accuracy is just one criteria out of three. Anyone down here or in Hattiesburg can remember the other two. Efficiency. Yes, efficiency is one. Robustness. Robustness is the other one. And in both cases, um, this method falls short. So first for efficiency... Um, solving a system of equations, now this is solving system of linear equations numerically, I'll get, that's really a subject for the second semester, but I'll just jump to the punchline. For obtaining a polynomial degree n requires order n cubed um, arithmetic operations. Um, and you might think, okay, who cares? Well, um, but we, the methods that we will learn about later, and one of them today, we can do much better. We can actually obtain a coefficient using order n squared work. And when n is large, that definitely is going to make a big difference. Um, 
And the reason why is generally all the entries in this matrix are going to be non-zero. Um, if we had a matrix where most of the entries are zero, then yes, this system could be solved faster, but we don't have that here. Um, the other problem is that simply solving a system is not robust. Uh, so this matrix, uh, or this, this system, equations, is uh, can be highly ill-conditioned. So in a sense of conditioning defined in the previous chapter, a problem is ill-conditioned if the solution is um, unduly sensitive to the data. Um, so a small change in the x values or the y values can lead to a large change in the computed solution. Um, and in particular, when the um, x values are close together. So if, if the points are closely clustered in the plane, um, that's when this matrix um, is close to being not invertible. Um, in, in fact, uh, one of the problems in this, in this section that I did not assign is about the computing. You can actually, there's a formula for a determinant of this matrix. If the determinant is zero, as uh, likely learned in uh, Math 326, uh, the matrix is not invertible. And the determinant is expressed in terms of products of the differences of these x values. So if any of those differences are zero, the determinant is zero. Um, now, we're assuming here that all the x values are distinct. But if they're very close, then um, solving a system is going to be a problem. OK. So, um, so we're not going to spend any more time on this approach. We need a, uh, a better approach. Now, how did this come about in the first place? It's because we chose to represent the polynomial in this form, which is logical. I mean, normally we think, OK, polynomial of whatever degree, this is a standard form for writing it down. Um, so I think, why not work with this? What, whatever form would there be? Well, outside of polynomial interpolation, um, there, 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 there may not be anything useful. But for this problem, there are multiple ways to write down this polynomial, multiple forms we can use that lead to better approaches. So I'm going to talk about um, one of those. But um, one more comment I want to make about this, though, before I move on from it. Um, so there is a unique solution because the matrix is invertible if and only if the x values stop that x values are distinct. So, yes, yeah, so if it's something that, like, as I mentioned, one of the problems in this section, and how it can be proven that this system does have a unique solution, so it's almost well posed. So, the three conditions solution exists, solution is unique, solution is dependent continuously on the data. So, the first two conditions are met as long as we have distinct x values. Um, all right. Now, so what's a better way? to proceed. That's where, where we get to um, Lagrange interpolation. Okay. So, so instead of the instead of writing Pn of x in standard form, which actually has a more proper term that will come up later power form. So how I wrote the polynomial earlier, a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared, etc. That's called power form. Um, we can use Lagrange form. So what is that? I'll write the polynomial as a sum of my y values times these polynomials um, where 
and I'll define these momentarily, is the J Lagrange polynomial of degree um, oh, sorry, I need to have n, not n minus 1. Okay. Of degree n of a point x0 up to xn. So, given these n plus 1 x values, these points determine these Lagrange polynomials. There are n plus 1 of them, so because j goes from 0 to n. Um, and they're of degree n. So the first subscript is always the degree. Um, and then the second subscript is just the index that counts from 0 up to the degree. Um, now, suppose... I'm going to des describe the ground polynomials in terms of properties that they need to satisfy, or conditions they need to satisfy. So I'm going to take this equation. Actually, let's go ahead and copy it. And I'm going to substitute in xi. So then I'm plugging in xi here. And the result of this has to be yi. So I plug in an x, I must get the corresponding y. So notice here in my summation, I have my y values times these polynomials. And but here I have all of them. But the result of the sum is only going to be one of them. So how can I ensure that? The only way I can make sure this happens, no matter what my x's and y's are, Each Lagrange polynomial must satisfy these conditions. So it must be equal to 1 when i is equal to j. And it must be equal to 0 if i is not equal to j. Um, so in other words, these Lagrange polynomials have the effect of selecting the proper y value. Um, so, so for instance, if I substitute in um, x1, so I have my points x0 up to xn, I substitute in x1. Um, I want y1 coming out. So L1, so j is equal to 1, I need to get a 1 here so that I, I, get, I, I just get y1. Um, any other, and for all other values of j, this has to be 0. That way the other y values cannot possibly be included in the result. <coughs> okay. So so this gives me something to go on in terms of actually coming up with polynomials that satisfy the right conditions. <clears throat> but that's going to be more easily illustrated if I return to my example. OK, so I have the following, p3 of x is equal to my first, okay, I'll write the general form first and then I'll fill in the specific numbers that I had. Okay, so I have y0, y1, y2, y3. OK. <clears throat> now, the um, 
So I'll do this as an equation array. Alright, so I, my specific numbers, my y values were 3, I'll just copy this again and fill in. Alright, so 3 is my first y value, and then my second y value was uh, minus 4. Uh, my third y value was 5, and my fourth y value is minus 6. Okay. Um, and my Lagrange polynomials have to satisfy uh, these properties. So for, in order for P3 of x0, which is equal to P3 of minus 1 to equal 3, which is y0. So plug in x0, you get y0, and here are the specific numbers involved. You must have a following. For the Lagrange polynomials, um, if I plug in minus 1 excuse me, into my first polynomial that has this y value, I, I need to get 1. If I plug in the same x value, put some space in here. If I plug in, um, okay. If I plug minus one into any other polynomial, I must get zero. Okay. So that way, that ensures that if I plug in x equal to minus one. These will not contribute anything. Um, but right now, I don't have any other inf information about this. So so I need to have other conditions on the other polynomials. So I'll fill those in. Okay, so my x values, my other x values, I have 0, 1, and 2. And these other points must be 0. Um, and then similar for the uh, other ones. Okay, so all right. So for this second point, x equals 0, I need this to be 0, but this needs to be 1. Um, okay, and then you need to fill in the remaining x values. Okay. Okay. Um, now, for the third point, when x equals 1, based on the data that I have here, the y value that I want is 5. And I already have that filled in for the third term. So I need this value to be 1. Okay. And when I plug in x equals 1, all others must be 0. Um, and then finally, for the last point, when x is equal to 2, I want y equal to be minus 6. So I want all of these terms at x equals 2 to be 0, except for the last one. So I fill in a 1 over here. Okay, so now all my conditions are complete. So notice, every Lagrange polynomial, you plug in one of the x values, you get 1. All others, you get 0. And that's based on what I have here. So whenever the um, 
index of your Lagrange polynomial matches the index of your x value, you get 1, otherwise 0. By the way, those of you who have had linear algebra, which for map majors I hope all of you would have had by this point, um, if you think of these numbers, the ones and zeros, as a matrix, what matrix is that? Do you recognize what that is? Say one, zero. Yeah, so matrix has ones down a diagonal, but zeros everywhere else. What matrix is that? Identity. It's the identity matrix. Um, so Lagrange polynomials with those x values plugged in, if you arrange them as a matrix, it is the identity matrix. And that's why Instead of this approach, where we have a full matrix, all entries non-zero, we have a matrix here that is trivial. Um, finding the Lagrange po uh, the interpolating polynomial this way will take a lot less work, because we're constructing a trivial system to solve. OK. Now, here we have enough information to construct the Lagrange polynomials. So I'm going to start with this one. L30. So I have four conditions on it. It must be zero at these three points. It must be one at this point. Now, the degree, the first subscript, the three, that indicates the degree. It's the cubic, because our overall polynomial we're looking for is a cubic. Um, so a cubic polynomial has three roots. Well, here are the three roots, zero, one, and two. So right away, that tells me I can say that I have a following. I could say uh, include the factorization x minus 0, x minus 1, x minus 2. That's a starting point, but a very important one because now by giving you this factorization, if I plug in x equals 0, 1, or 2, I'm going to get 0. So we pretty much have a factorization, but what about this property? If I plug in x equal minus 1 down here, I'm not going to get 1. So what can I do to this? It's, we're almost there. What can I do to this to make sure that this condition is also satisfied? Because if I plug in x equal minus 1, I'm going to get minus 1 times minus 2 times minus 3. I'm going to get minus 6. So what should I do? Sorry, what? Can you repeat, please? So you should always get one, right? Yes. So you get back one at all the time. I, I, yeah. So I need to modify this. So you get one every time. Right. So what about you start from the first? Last and first. So, so, so if you have x at the first one for two, x for the next one at one, x for the next one at zero, and that will give you back. Okay, you get back. But right there, if x is plugged into to um, to the second. If two is plugged into for one for x right there, you get one. If one is plugged in right there, the second, for the very first one, you'll get back one, because zero from one is one. And then... Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm... So I guess you still run out of one. So okay, all right. Work. The, so it, it, one right here, I'll get one back. Because yeah. it's best to use this as a starting point, because... You plug two right there. Because at least it has one. the correct zeros. So a polynomial like this, these are, the, these are the roots. So what we know is this polynomial is a multiple of the one we need. So all we've got to do is find the right constant to multiply this by, and it'll still have the correct roots, but then the value at this point will also be 1. So I mentioned if I plug in x equal minus 1 in here, I don't get 1. I get minus 6. Mm -hmm. So what should I do? Yeah, I, I think I heard from up here. Divide by minus six. Minus, minus two plus one times one plus one times one times. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So 
you have to divide by what you would get from here if you did plug in minus 1. So here's what you can do. I make this a fraction of this as a numerator. If I plug in minus 1 minus 0, and minus 1 minus 1, minus 1 minus 2. So that way, if I plug in x equal minus 1 up here, these will all match and cancel so that we get 1. Um, so, um, so, so this polynomial has, has now satisfies all the conditions. Um, so you plug in 0, 1, or 2, one of these factors will be 0 and it gets wiped out. If you plug in x equal minus 1, these factors, these will be the same, these will be the same, these will be the same, they cancel. Let's try this with the next one. Okay. So, um, now I move to this column. So, to make sure that the four conditions are satisfied, that's equal to zero at these three points, but equal to one at this point, following what was done here, what should I put here? X plus one. Um, okay, x plus one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at the three points where it's supposed to be 0, minus 1, 1, and 2, those are the roots. So now these three conditions are satisfied. And then how do I finish it off? Yeah, so now it's, I want it to be 1 at x equals 0, so then 0, okay, close that again. Yeah. Okay, um, and there you have it. So, um, so wherever you want it to be zero is subtracted from x up top. And you also have those subtracted in the factors at the bottom. But here you put whatever x value you want it to be one at, so x equals zero in this case, is what goes here. So with zero you plug in for x for this one, right? Um, yeah, because at, at x equals zero, this is the polynomial we're working on now, at x equals 0, I want the result to be 1. Okay. Yeah, so sure enough, I plug in 0 here, 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 all the factors match and cancel. Okay. Um, and then this process would continue. I would construct L32 and L33 in the same way. Um, so in general, and actually, um, um, on page 250 is where all four of them are worked out. So I want to show you the general formula with however many points you have. Okay. All right, so I actually have a uh, product. Okay. Um. I need to put this in the numerator. Okay. I'll explain all this in a moment. Okay. So this is a general formula for a Lagrange polynomial. Um, so I want it to be 1 when x equals xj. I want it to be 0 at all the other data points. So I have factors for every i going from 0 to n except j. I skip over that one. And I have x minus xi. So what that means is if I plug in any of the x values except xj, I'll get 0 because this factor will be 0. Then downstairs, if I plug in x equal xj up here for x, it will match this factor and cancel. And that's how we'll get 1 um, in that case. All right. <clears throat>
Actually, probably, well, so I certainly could have phrased this as a as a product of these fractions instead of a fraction of products, but okay, okay. So that's what was followed in these cases. Um, okay, so then, um, and it's also shown in, in the example in, in the text. So once these are worked out, then of course a lot of simplifying can happen, or you can express it in whatever form um, you want, and then uh, construct a polynomial from there. Um, so, um, but as far as uh, constructing these polynomials in MATLAB, it's um, the statement is P equals polyfit. Um, your x, you have a vector of x's, a vector of y's, and then a specified degree of a polynomial. Um, that fits. Um, so, uh, so x and y should be vectors of the same length. That specify your data points, um, but for um, polynomial interpolation, you should use n equal to the length of x minus one. And the reason for that is, however many points you have, the, per, the degree of the interpolating polynomial is always one less. So if, if you want to do polynomial interpolation, if it's describing here. For instance, if, if, uh, if x and y are vectors of four values each, then you should set n equal to three. Um, if you use a different value for n, then MATLAB's going to use a different technique, which we're not talking about here, like perhaps least squares fit or something like that. Or it might complain to you. Um, so for, for polynomial interpolation, it's best to use this. <clears throat> Oddly enough, though, um, I, was, I was quite disappointed to find that... Um, Polyfit actually uses the terrible technique that I was telling you about. Um, I'm not sure what they were thinking there, but <clears throat> I guess if n is pretty small, it may not be such, such a big deal, but um, something I personally object to. Okay. Now, the one thing we can tell just by looking at these two Lagrange polynomials, and you imagine making two more, it's pretty cumbersome. Um, and because uh, uh, after you finish this, then you have to get the polynomials in the right form and all that. And also, to, once you have the polynomial, suppose you want to plug in other x values. So I'm taking whatever x value I have and substituting into here. So I have to uh, substitute into each Lagrange polynomial, then multiply by the corresponding y values, and then I have my result. Whereas the polynomial expressed in this form, power form, is uh, just visually, see it's, it's nicer to work with. Um, also, later we'll see uh, polynomials written what's called nested power form to evaluate more efficiently uh, by computer. So Lagrange, um, so if, if the thing with Lagrange polynomials is there's a, there's a nice intuitive way to construct them to make sure that you plug in each x, you get the correct y um, from what we see here. But the drawback is, um, whoops, I totally have my notes sectioned the wrong way. Um, OK. Um, now. So drawback of Lagrange polynomials they're inefficient to evaluate. Um, you can rearrange them to get them into like the power form that I was pointing out, but that also is a lot of work. Um, so, um, so more specifically, um, for degree n. 
requires degree uh, or n squared arithmetic operations to evaluate at a single point. Um, whereas um, if you use power form, like I showed you earlier, um, we have n plus 1 terms for a polynomial degree n. Um, and if arranged in the right, if you arrange the computations in the right way, order n arithmetic operations is possible. Um, it's not something I'll get into today, like next week, is when I can show you um, how that is done. So this is a terrible efficiency gap. And um, so this, so Lagrange polynomials may be nicer to construct, but once you need to use them, um, they're, uh, they're not so practical. So fortunately, there's a, um, there's an alternative that still makes use of um, Lagrange polynomials um, that is a more efficient way to evaluate. So, and it turns out that this approach I'm going to show you, barycentric interpolation, is um, is actually a very recent development. Two thousand four is when it was developed. Um, so, uh, a lot of numerical analysis was developed like in the sixties. That seemed to be like a golden age for it because that's when electronic computers had been around for not terribly long yet. But uh, but they're starting to get more widely used, and that's where a lot of the techniques were developed and improved. But even now, for something as generic as polynomial interpolation, there's occasionally a new advance. Um, and uh, this is an example of that. And actually, I personally know the guy who developed it. Uh, he's a professor at uh, Oxford, uh, one in England, uh, not Ole Miss. So, um, I would guess that. I thought he was there. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> um, you been out there? Uh, to Oxford? Yeah. Uh, Oxford. Yeah, I went to a conference there. Um, yeah, I, 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 I go to the UK every few years for various conferences and stuff. Okay. Um, so, how does barycentric interpolation work? First, we compute what are called the barycentric weights. So, I'll give you a formula for them. So, that's a product similar to how I defined the Lagrange polynomials. We go i goes from zero to n, but we skip j because we're computing weight number j. And what we have is one over x j minus x i. Now this expression we've actually already seen. These are so this is the denominator of Lagrange polynomial. That's what we divided by to make sure that when we plug in xj, we get 1. So we go ahead and compute these up front. Now, on the one hand, this requires order n squared operations. Well, to be more clear, order n operations per weight. Um, so the overall process, since we have to compute n plus 1 weights, because we have to do this for um, j equals 0 up to n. Uh, so for each Lagrange polynomial, those numbers that go into the denominator, we just compute those up front. Now, this is still order n squared work, except, so you might think, oh, this is not really an improvement over this, except for one thing. You'll have to do it once. Okay. 
So it's like a pre, you think of it as like a pre-processing step. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, once you have the um, weights, then we have a following. I can express each Lagrange polynomial in a slightly different form. Um, so I have the um, so I have a weight. So it's, uh, so really, uh, sorry, I, I goofed here. It's one over the denominator. So the one over is included in this. So that's why the weight itself actually goes in the numerator. Sorry about that. Um, and then I have x minus x j in the denominator. Okay. And then I have in the numerator, I have this product where this product, pi n of x, this is actually an expression that comes up fairly often, is a product of x minus all the x values. So the idea is for polynomial number j, here we have all the linear factors, but we have x minus xj in the denominator, so that cancels with one of these. That gives you the numerator of Lagrange polynomials that I showed you earlier, and that the wj counts for the denominator. Now, you might think, well, so what? Why do we have why, why is this new form going to help us? Um, here's why. Because I can take these Lagrange polynomials and multiply them by the y values to express my interpolating polynomial this way. So I can have um, okay, so I have a sum from j equals 0 to n yj times Lagrange polynomial. Now, if I go ahead and copy that, and put that in here. Oh, wait, I don't need, I don't need this again. Okay. Now, all I've done here because my Pn of x I described earlier as a sum, y's times Lagrange's. So all I've done is I put my new definition of my, my new formula for Lagrange's in here. And that's what brings me to here. But here's where things get interesting. Notice pi n of x does not depend on j at all. What does that mean? I can factor it out. So I'll go ahead and do that. So now my interpolating polynomial is expressed this way. Now, that still doesn't help me very much until I do this. Um, what if my function is just equal to 1? Then I could do the same thing. I could set, uh, so I have 1 is equal to the same thing except my y values are equal to 1, so I don't need that. Okay, so here I'm describing my polynomial this way with my whatever y values I have. Here I'm describing a function 1 the same way with y equal to 1. So now I divide the equations, both sides. Pi n of x cancels. That's the key right there. So I have pn over 1, so that's just pn. The pi n's cancel, so this sum is all that is left. Well, this sum divided by this sum. Okay, so now I have, okay, so fill in those sums. This one up top. 
and then this one down below. Okay, so now I have this. This is my expression. This is barycentric interpolation. So if I want to evaluate my interpolating polynomial at a single x value, I can just use this. So this requires only order n arithmetic operations to evaluate a given x as opposed to n squared if you just use Lagrange polynomial as uh, previously written. <clears throat> so questions about what happened here? Now, two of the homework problems from this section deal with um, barycentric interpolation. So in the first one, you write a function that's sole job is to compute the barycentric weight. So you're given x values, that's your input argument, and you compute these weights. Um, the other function that actually carries out barycentric interpolation, you're given a, a vector of x values. For each of those x values, you evaluate this um, expression. And to do that, you use a barycentric weight. So in other words, your function for this problem will call your barycentric weights function to get these w values, and then you'll use them in here. Um, now, one important point to make about this expression is, notice it's undefined at your data, your, your x values from your data points. If I plug in any of the x values from my given data, one of these denominators is going to be 0. So I can't evaluate this. But I don't need to, because if I plug in x, like xi, I know what the result's supposed to be. It's yi. So I wouldn't need to evaluate this anyway to get that. Um, so this is for x is not equal to any xi. But we know the result. <clears throat> OK. So that's the idea behind Lagrange interpolation and a more efficient way to evaluate it that was developed uh, less, uh, only 15 years ago. Um, but there are still other methods for interpolation. And that's, that's what I'll um, uh, cover next week. OK. Now, um, we have time, so does anyone want to fire any homework questions at me from down here or up there? Okay, uh, I heard something up there, I'll get to you in a moment, um, unless you're asking about the same problem. Number 19? Okay. Oh yeah, one I one I knew would be a pain. <laughs> um, okay, so well, do you have a particular question about it, or I review, or uh, it's asked here what uniformly distributed means. Oh wait, wait, are you talking about a different problem? Oh, wait, wait for this section? Yes, she's on concentric A, 1A. Oh, um, equally spaced. Oh. Um, that is specifically discussed in the reading, whether they are or not. What well, This question. Are floating point numbers equally spaced, which is uniformly distributed, on the real number line. Um, it, yeah, so um, that, that is, specific issue is discussed in this section, 
you'll you'll find it. Okay. All right. So, question about this one. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, now, I have to be very careful discussing this problem in the interest of not giving anything away. Uh, based on email questions, I know at least, or maybe a, a few of you, um, have some idea on how to proceed. So, please don't shout out. Um, okay. So, there's really two main problems that come up with floating point arithmetic. Uh, one is cancellation error, but that only comes from subtraction. So, what's the other big problem that can come about? Overflow. Yeah, overflow is the other issue. So, now, I've given you the assumption that x, y, and z, those are okay. Those are representable. But even though the final result and the input data have uh, reasonable magnitudes, um, but you go through a process of computing z, okay, so you're squaring x, squaring y, adding them, then, then taking square root, it's still possible for an operation along the way to overflow. Uh, to give you a number that's too big. Um, so the first task is to identify what kind of operation um, would call, could lead to that, at least in certain circumstances. Because most numbers, x and y, you'd plug into this, you're not going to have any problem at all. But um, depending on, on the x and y, you might. So is there a situation where overflow um, can occur? Underflow can also occur, but since we could just say zero in that case, we're not going to think about that. Um, okay. Oh, the overflow is mentioned in the problem. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Now, for simplicity's sake, and I mentioned this in a response to an email question, it's okay to assume that one of the numbers is um, like x is larger than y, because that would affect your approach. Otherwise, you have to do a case like, well, if x is greater than y, you do this. Otherwise, you do this that are basically the same thing with the roles of an x and y reverse. So you might as well just assume that x is the larger of the two. Um, so operations like squaring, adding, etc., can they're only going to cause problems for certain numbers uh, of certain magnitudes. So if you rewrite this expression algebraically in such a way that that problematic operation is performed on numbers that are safe, then that's a good way to go. Um, now, so the idea is, when it comes to rewriting, and I guess this is really the crux of a, the problem, really what gives us a difficulty, what sorts of things can you do? Um, you, because you can, um, uh, you, you can multiply and divide by, by itself, you can, you can uh, try uh, factoring things out, because uh, Technically, you can factor anything out of anything as long as you compensate for it properly. Um, operations like that, to make sure that whatever operation that might cause overflow is not applied to the type of number that would lead to overflow. So why do we need to compute that to get an overflow? And then two, we need to make, we rearrange or rewrite that formula so we don't get overflow. Yeah, so you have to understand what circumstances lead to overflow first yeah. to figure out what kind of rewrite is going to work. Is it still an overflow when, like, your index goes out of bounds? Oh, um, that's a different kind of problem. I mean, is it overflow? Oh, um, oh, you mean, like, just... Are you saying, like, for example, if an array has 100 elements and you access element 101, or...? Yeah, just if, uh, if it's basically mathematically it's treated as an array and you want to have a set, it's actually Oh, um, that's, that's a different sort of issue. It, it, that might be described in the same way, using the same verbiage, but it, it's... it's um, like, overflow happens when you... 
performing whatever operation on your numbers and, and you're trying to figure out what is the mantissa and exponent of a result. And uh, so, for example, you're multiplying. Um, you have the exponents of your operands, and you're going to add those exponents together. But what if the sum of those exponents is greater than capital U? You've overflown. So think about that, because then what kind of exponents could numbers have where the numbers themselves are valid, but then you multiply them and you get overflow? Um, yeah, like, so as an example, suppose I have, uh, suppose my capital U is a thousand. That's the largest exponent I'm allowed to have. So then I have a number uh, that's on the order, let's say I'm in base 10. So I have a number of, let's say, 10 to the 600. Look what happens when I square it and what the exponent will be. Or on the square root of 600. Uh, yeah, so, so, so yeah, if I'm taking 10 to the 600 and squaring it, but the maximum exponent I'm allowed to represent is only 1,000. Oh. Yeah. So Well, this isn't even about significant digits necessarily, but the exponents. Because I'm going to, uh, because when, once I square that number, I'm doubling that exponent. If the exponent is already large to begin with, Oh, wait, which one? I was thinking about the same thing, like you say, make the exponent larger. Yeah. For one. And make it smaller for one. Yeah. That could mm. be like, or if you don't want to curve it, just. Then we come back to similar, but not same as the formula for overflow. But not the same. Mm. Because it's one minus the base. Also, we, I got a problem with 25. 25. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so, cancellation will recur if you're subtracting two numbers that are very close to each other. Now, um, now the thing is, you might, think, you might be thinking, oh, but x equals 1 is a problem. If x equals 1, you plug in here, you're done for. This is going to be undefined. So I'm not talking about x equals 1. Um, but if you think about the um, subtractions that are performed in this expression, what values, which values of x um, would lead to Subtraction of close numbers, where the, the actual expression as a whole is still defined, but we have a subtraction of close numbers occurring, uh, or nearly equal numbers. So that's why I'm, I'm just going to exclude x equals 1, because that's a whole other issue. You just, you're not going to get a value at all. Um, so um, so any, su any subtraction in your expression, if he numbers being subtracted can be very close, that's a cancellation error. Um, so the idea is, okay, you want to rewrite this in such a way that for those kind of x values, so whatever x values will cause a problem with this expression, if you plug those same ones into your new expression, 
you won't have the same problem. Um, and it's various things you could do with an expression like this involving you know, various operations that you are accustomed to doing with fractions uh, to get an equivalent but very different expression for this. So you say, when I rewrite back this, these two fractions, I should get back the same thing that I get from this? Um, yeah, it's, it's got to be equivalent. Uh, yeah, it produces the same value, but it'll do it in such a way that the same problematic subtraction you have in the original does not occur in the new one. Uh, if I was plugging 2 for x, um, and I get back out, because x2 would have been an f over here, and 1 third minus that. Well, so, okay, let, so, let's, let's, just take, let's talk about x equals 2, just... Okay, so I plug in x equal 2, and I get uh, minus 1 for the first fraction. And then I get uh, 1 third for the other. So I have minus 1 and minus 1 third. That is a perfectly safe subtraction, because the numbers being subtracted are nowhere near each other. But for what values of x will these two be nearly equal? Well, I'll we'll start by thinking what, if, what would make them exactly equal. Um, but it's when they're nearly equal... Um, that's of, of greatest concern. Um, so, are you wanting us to just rearrange it where the cancellation doesn't occur in the denominator or in all? Well, in, in the overall expression, yeah. Um, yeah, because the only way you're going to get cancellation in a denominator is if x is plus or minus 1. But then the whole expression is undefined. So, we can't do anything about that. But there are other x values that you could plug in here where you don't have a division by 0 anywhere. But And if you were doing this on paper, you could definitely get a result. But computer arithmetic is going to have a problem with it because you're subtracting nearly equal numbers. Um, you probably can by uh, using um, uh, well, use format long, so that yeah, to see as many decimal places as you can. Sure. But yeah, the catastrophic cancellation is visible. Um, so you're trying to get rid of subtraction. Not, I wouldn't say any subtraction. Your final expression will have a subtraction in it. We're trying to avoid a problematic subtraction. Okay. So we are trying to avoid problematic subtraction on the final expression, not just one. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I... We are trying to avoid the problematic subtraction on the final expression, not just one. Um, right. Uh, yeah. So, so, so any sub so whatever whatever x values cause a problem in the original will not cause a problem in the new one. Um, or, or that, that you, 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 don't have this, you no longer have subtraction of these nearly equal numbers when you plug in these bad x's. Um, now, a reason, I want to fo a reason I'm focusing on you know, for which values of x is there a problem, if I go back to another problem that you have, one involving a quadratic formula. Um, now, this quadratic formula... In the case where b is much greater than a and c, one of these roots is going to be okay, and the other root is going to be bad because of cancellation. In problem 22, when you revamp a quadratic formula and get a new one, which root is bad and which one is good will swap. There is no quadratic formula that's safe for both or safe for neither just because you have it's plus or minus. But what will happen is you'll have two quadratic formulas. The original one is safe for one of the roots. The new one is safe for the other root. So either way, so you're, you're covered. So, um, so, so here, this expression is bad for only certain x's. So you just want to make it okay for those x's. So whenever you rewrite it, there will be new x's that you still call cancellation, but not the ones that not call 
Um, it, that can happen. I'm not saying it will happen. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay. Um, okay, this one. Yes. Uh, my first question is whenever you, uh, the, the number that you're Oh uh, yeah, v, um, yeah. There's no restriction on these numbers. Um, I mean, yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. The only conditions that are positive, so we, we don't have any cancellation concern. Yep. And then I sorted it ascending, mm -hmm. and then I sorted it uh, descending, and I made one A and one B. Right. If I do the sum of A, will it add those in order? If I just do the sum of A, will it add from the least to the greatest? If I have to sort it from the least to the greatest? Um, oh, like if you use a sum function? Yes. Probably will add them in the order in which they occur. I, I'm not aware if they have some uh, um, logic in there to. Do something else. I did it on a small one, and it did. Um, well, I didn't know how it. Um, I didn't if, know how it added them. I knew it was the correct answer. If you want to be sure about the order in which they're being added, use a for loop. No, I'm not sure about the order being added. Um, I want to make sure because I don't know. Yeah, yeah, because I can't comment on how some behaves. Um, because people come up with different techniques for adding for computing sums to try to reduce uh, issues due to round off error and they may have implemented that in their sum function and I don't know use a use a for loop um, if you have a if, if you implement uh, functionality of sum yourself or you set a variable equal to zero well actually it's like um, I have an example here um, way back in the tutorial for for loops. So if you if you just go ahead and do it like this, um, I hear you're just computing the sum this way. It, it'll do it as you as you prescribe. What what page is that? Um, oh, uh, twenty seven. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So that really gets to the crux of a problem. Okay, is, uh, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So I so I recommend looking at uh, the discussion, whether it's, it's it's in the book or also I talked about a little in class about um, what can happen when you're adding that can lead to uh, uh, loss of precision. Okay. All right, we still have some time for further questions.
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not having difficulty understanding. Oh, um, okay. Are you talking about a particular problem so I can focus on that? Or. Um. So, so uh, wait, so you're saying if your mantissa starts with a zero? Or. Yeah, like zero line paper, what's the precision number? Wait, precision number? Is that what you're asking? Um, well, yeah, cause that's, that's not really a thing. Um, sorry. Um, now, but that's an example of what's called a denormalized number. Because normal, when, it, when you have a normalized number, the first digit in the mantissa of a one to the left of a decimal point must be non-zero. But in this case, since it's 0 0.34, you have two significant digits. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so as long as p is at least two, it can be represented exactly. Um, now, I'm not sure if you're asking about something related to. Let me find the right problem. If, um, if the precision is two and something zero point zero zero something, then is it only the case that it can be represented exactly when it is normalized? Oh. Um, well, that would depend on what, what the exponents are. Uh, and chances are the exponent wide range would be wide enough um, that it still could be represented exactly. So so if, you, if you're asking about something like like a number like this, is that what you're asking? Here's a more extreme case. Um, so as long as... Um, so, 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 so this is on the order of... Uh, 10, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Um, okay, so I'm not, I'm not sure if this addresses your question because I'm also I'm still having trouble difficult here difficulty understanding everything it has said over a connection. Sorry, but um, so so this number can be represented as long as since there are five digits here. Um, that your precision has at least five digits, and the exponent allows for the fact that since this is, you know, in scientific notation, this would be three point four three nine four times ten to the minus ten. Um, so as long as your exponent range includes minus, or sorry, ten to the minus nine rather. Um, so as long as your exponent range included minus nine, and you had at least p being five for the significant digits. Uh, then that number can be represented exactly in a decimal floating point system. Um, could you repeat, please, what is it that the book didn't clarify? Uh, I might just not have found it, but I'm just confused whether you can or can't represent the number of digits by decimal numbers not normalized as long as that. Okay. Um, the reason why I, didn't, I don't bring that up specifically is because that's just how that depends on the implementation of a floating point system. Um, uh, so really, all I'm doing is I'm explaining. Okay, here are two conventions you can follow: that numbers are normalized or they're not. And then what IEEE specifically does, because that's something I can comment on. Um, so it's really up to the specification of any floating point standard as to whether um, denormalized numbers are permitted, and if so, under what circumstance. Just as like IEEE generally has numbers normalized unless the exponent is set to the lowest value, in which case their denormalized numbers are, um, are allowed. Now, here's what that really means from an implementation point of view. And this is maybe something I didn't really get into enough. Um, Actually, I better. I should type this out. Um, uh, 
Okay. Um, so consider um, this mantissa in binary. So I'm just going to make one up. Um, so in other words, actual digits stored. Um, okay. So I, I need zeros and ones. So all right. So suppose, uh, like when I was showing you in MATLAB earlier in a, in a previous class where I showed format hex and we had the hexadecimal digits um, and I could from there extract the binary digits. So suppose you get your binary digits from your mantissa from your eight bytes of storage and you get this. So um, Normalization is about how these digits are interpreted. So, um, so in binary, in binary, these are only the digits to the right of the. I, I, we always say decimal point, but in this case, it's really the binary point. Um, so the number represented, just the mantissa part, I'm not even talking about the exponent yet, is first digit is a 1, so that would be 1 half. Then we have a 0, so we don't have anything in the 1 quarter place. Then 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth plus 1 thirty second, uh, 64, plus 1 over 256, and so on. So that number is represented, so, so this is the number represented by these binary digits that are to the right of a binary point. Now, if, if the number is not normalized, then then this is the actual mantissa, or the whole mantissa. This number that I've described here, that's the value of a mantissa. If the number is normalized, there's an implied one. Because the normalized number, the digit to the left of a decimal point must be non-zero. Therefore, in binary, it must be 1. So I would actually add 1 to this value, and that's my mantissa. And then you take into account the exponent, etc. So um, in IEEE, if the exponent is equal to minus 1022, which is the lower limit, whatever digits you have here in your, in your mantissa are interpreted as in there's not a 1 sitting there. Any other exponent value, that plus 1 is assumed. So normalization or not norm or normalized or not normalized is about how the bits that you have are interpreted. And so for the purpose of actually coming up with a value of a number and therefore performing whatever floating point arithmetic. So someone could develop a floating point standard that says all numbers are normalized no matter what. No gradual underflow, nothing. They're all normalized. Or no numbers are normalized. Um, but there is no applied one there. Whatever you see in the mantissa and that's actually stored in those eight bytes, that's it. Um, and so IEEE has gone with... Uh, middle ground because there are good reasons to normalize or not normalize. <clears throat> so I don't know if that gets to your point, but your, your question. Well, unfortunately, we're also out of time. <laughs> um, I do want to make one quick announcement. Um, okay. 
So, because of the, the midterminus class is not coming up for a while. It's actually going to be on October 22nd, which is a Thursday. Um, no, it's actually a Tuesday. But notice, because of that, there's a two-week gap uh, between uh, homework five and homework six, which we haven't got to that material yet. Um, but with that in mind, um, I'll, 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 for each of these assignments, these, these three right here, um, I will not enforce late penalties immediately. So um, I can easily you know, give a couple days slack. Uh, so for example, if you're still trying to grind through this assignment um, and you get it into me like uh, you know, tomorrow or Thursday, uh, then that's, that, that's good. So, uh, so we, we definitely have a little room in the schedule um, uh, to, to, to make that happen because, because of this gap. Uh, when we get closer, and after we've seen more of this material, I will be putting out a practice midterm. Um, that, because uh, the class period before the midterm, October 17th, that'll be entirely review. And I'll uh, put, uh, so we'll discuss the practice uh, mid mid midterm if any of your questions you, you may have. So that way, there's no surprises. Out before we review again. So yeah, yeah, you'll, yeah. I'll, I'll have, try to have that. Actually, I'll, I'll try to make it up during the break. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, a solution also. But. <clears throat> yes, yes. Yeah, yes. This assignment as well. Um, I'll, I'll update the site. Okay, um, yeah. I'll, I'll just put that in here. Um, Okay, so I, need, I still need to update this page, but here. Okay. Yep. All right, well, <laughs> yeah, we've gone five minutes past time, so. <clears throat> Everybody try to enjoy fall break. <laughs> hey, I've got two. I've got a one-hour Friday class that I don't have to go to. Oh, okay, that's something. <laughs> Oh yeah, down down here, yeah, there's nothing. So. <laughs> oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> oh really? I can't even get onto it on my phone. This oh. is the old, this is like the farthest I can get. Yeah. Oh, um, I hear, uh, so you were stalking, Oh, it's just the numerator first. So you can do, you see that name? So that was WWW required. Yeah, I do the WWE. And are you using the campus Wi-Fi? Yeah. Or no, I'm not doing it. I'm just doing the Oh. Would that be the issue? Yeah, it might be. I I I don't think I've ever done that. I just really like that. that. Try it on like a new Now, um, when you say you try to get to on your phone, is that including off campus? Uh, not on. Basically, yeah. I'll show you. I'll show you when we. Because I do this. Yeah. Because I do this. Yeah. No. That, that, would be, that would be a different answer than. Um, but it would be equivalent. No. Because you would be one third and. Not for all values. Not for all values. But it, it would be equivalent for everything. No. If you plug in. No, so one, okay. Can I do it in one for Oh, um. Well, if you plug in. Um, yeah, have you been on Edge Room lately? The same thing. No. So, I usually uh, just use public. Okay, because the thing about Edge Room is not too long ago they changed how you log into it. Oh. It has to be like W, your ID, at usm.edu. They added that on there. I thought 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 and what browser are you using? Uh, Chrome, but I also tried it on Firefox and okay. Explorer, and it hmm. gave me the same issue. Freaky. Oh, so okay. Um, 
Now, um, <clears throat> okay, so if I connect to the public one, Oh, oh now I can't get to anything. Um, oh, wait, I need to. Well, that's weird. Well, I can't even get to Google, let alone my site. Um, oh, okay, CNN just came up. So if I try. Google. Okay, so now I'll try to get to my site. Um, right, I need to. But now it's now it's hanging on my page. Um, yeah, that one is failing. <laughs> yeah, so I can't get to it when I'm on public. Oh, so it must be the. It must be the. Um, the website, the, the, the internet itself. Yeah, um, or, or maybe some, something about the public network and how it implements security or something. Or Yeah. Um, so now, so if only you can get onto EduRom, <laughs> then you would be able to get to it. Yeah, um, installing whatever they need. Okay. Oh, jeez. Yeah, Isn't this always larger than this? Isn't the X always larger than the Y? I think it's still the X is larger than the Y. What is this at the bottom, X? Yeah, X. So Y is smaller, the Y is larger than the X. Someone had to bring up a question. Maybe you're gone. Okay. So X is over Y now. So, so what if you have a larger X right here than this one? 